Governor, of course, we're delighted uh, that you have agreed to chair this panel, and uh, uh, it's a pleasure uh, to have you at this event, although remotely, and um, we're looking forward. I'm going to dispense with long introductions, but of course, uh, we watch closely at uh, the, your work and uh, the work of the Council uh, in, uh, in total. Um, and, uh, of course, what's happening next and what's happening with this strategy review, everyone is excited here to contribute to it. So, without further ado, over to you. As Chair, uh, the speakers are supposed to stick to 15 minutes, and uh, so there is enough time for questions, and I can help you if there is uh, a need to read questions uh, submitted in writing via Slido. Um, it'd be great if we can get to those. I'd be happy to help with reading if it uh, makes your job easier. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Volker. I hope uh, that you can uh, hear me well. Um, unfortunately, I'm uh, not anymore in Berlin. I was uh, yesterday in Berlin, but now uh, I'm, I'm already in, in, in Madrid. And, and yes, um, um, as, as you said, uh, uh, Volker, I will try to be stricter than my friend and colleague uh, Jens uh, was uh, in, the previous, uh, in the previous panel. Um, so after uh, discussing the ECB's uh, mandate uh, in the first uh, of today's uh, debate, we are now moving to another very important uh, subject uh, that has, uh, of course, received uh, also a lot of attention over the last year, uh, GRs uh, in general, that is the ECB instruments uh, for crisis and, and normal times. It's obvious to, to everybody that the great uh, financial crisis uh, a decade ago uh, has enlarged uh, the ECB uh, toolkit uh, with new policy instruments, including for sure asset purchases, lending programs, negative rates or, or forward uh, guidance, among others. The outbreak of the pandemic this year led uh, the ECB to uh, even step up uh, some of these uh, tools, uh, for instance, uh, by introducing the pandemic purchase program and by introducing changes in, in others. And of course, there are many questions related to these instruments that um, need to be uh, addressed, uh, how effective uh, these instruments are, how they reinforce uh, each other, uh, what the potential side effects uh, are, or which of them will be, uh, become or should become part of the ECB's toolkit in normal times, uh, 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 I, I am pretty sure that our uh, colleagues in the panel will uh, try to answer all of these uh, questions. Um, so let me just uh, briefly introduce uh, our three speakers. Uh, we have uh, first uh, Lucrezia Reichling, who is uh, entirely a professor of economics at the, at the London Business School, uh, Atanasios Orfanides, uh, who among other responsibilities is uh, currently a professor of global economics and management at the MIT Sloan School of Management, and uh, last but not least, uh, my colleague uh, in various international debates, uh, Claudio Borio, who has been leading the monetary and economic department of the BIS uh, over the last uh, seven uh, years. Uh, so um, I think we don't need uh, more introduction from uh, my side. I will give uh, quickly the floor first to Lucrecia, uh, then to, to Atanasio, and finally to, to Claudio, uh, uh, before opening then the, the Q&A uh, session. So please, uh, Lucrecia, you have the floor. Oh dear, we can't hear. I said, I, that I, hear, uh, I, said that I felt I feel a little bit lonely here on this podium, <laughs> and uh, but I'm glad that I decided to come because uh, you know this is my first physical meeting uh, after the lockdown and COVID and so on. So it feels, you know, that something. Uh, hopefully, there will be progress. Although I understand that uh, many of you couldn't come because things are getting worse in some countries. So anyway, coming to the, um, to the topic, I think that uh, to frame any discussion on non-standard policies uh, and uh, you know, their effectiveness uh, and the risk, uh, it is important uh, um, to understand that uh, the consensus of what, on what monetary policy should be and uh, how it works also has changed uh, uh, since the crisis, since actually I would say 2007, and this not only, of course, uh, in the euro area. We used to think that uh, uh, financial frictions were small and that the efficient market hypothesis was a reasonable working approximation. And we also used to think that financial quantities, um, in general, the size and the structure uh, of the central bank's balance sheet uh, uh, were irrelevant. And with this uh, idea, there was a, a certain consensus on what the central bank was supposed to do and what the central banks were supposed not to do. 
Now, uh, you know, after more than 10 years, I would say that uh, what we call no standard policies have become standard. In fact, uh, I would suggest that we should not call them no standard anymore. I teach a course in monetary economics at the Land of Business School, and when I tell my students uh, no standard policy that have been going on since 2007, then they were possible, you know, in high school, they don't understand this word no standards. So we are in a new world, and this has to be a knowledge. And, uh, you know, this is not only because pragmatically central banks had to do a certain number of things, but also, uh, you know, we also understand uh, the interaction between economic policy, monetary policy, and the financial markets in a different way. For example, we now understand that financial frictions are pervasive, uh, and not just during the crisis, also in normal times. Uh, we also uh, are in a... Uh, you know, de facto change institutional framework in which central banks have new responsibilities uh, beside monetary policy, and also they have more instruments. It's not true that they just have one instrument, they have many instruments. Um, they also have a market-making role beyond uh, what we call the traditional lender of last resort role. And, uh, you know, of course, the world today is unrecognizable from the world of yesterday. So we have a large balance sheet, uh, which have been used proactively. Uh, and they've been used proactively also away from the zero lower bound. Uh, if we think, for example, of the first phase of the so-called no-standard policies at the ECB. And, um, you know, not only the, uh, the ECB, but also other central banks in the world have interest rate on reserves now. And, uh, you know, as a consequence, we have seen a large expansion of the monetary base uh, without uh, inflation. So, uh, therefore, there is a new reality. As I said, uh, non-standard policy are the new normal. They have been used in crisis uh, and non-crisis time. And, uh, um, and you know, uh, they have, of course, uh, this policy. They have served both monetary policy objectives and financial stability objectives. Uh, we, in understanding uh, how we should be using these instruments and what uh, are the implications of this new normal, we also have to appreciate that for the reasons that were discussed also in the previous panel, um, there is no way back. So the future will not be like uh, the 90s, most likely. And this is for many reasons. I think the excess demand for safe assets will continue to be large because of precautionary savings, uh, demographic uh, dynamics, uh, the leveraging and so uncertainty. There are also new risks which are emerging with uncertain effect on the economy. I'm thinking here of climate, technology, health. And of course, uh, you know, the big elephant in the room is that legacy debt will be with us for a long time. So we have to think about monetary policy in a phase of very high public debt, very far away from the good world of, uh, you know, the 60% debt to GDP ratios that we had in mind, uh, you know, when the euro uh, was established. So what are the relevant questions? And the first one, of course, and I think this is, uh, you know, the main objective of this panel is what is the evidence of the effectiveness of, the, of this policy? Have they worked? And what are the mechanisms and what are the conditions? The second question is, what are the risks? And the third question is, what is an adequate institutional design which is coherent uh, uh, with price stability and at the same time guarantee, guarantees the effectiveness of these policies as well as the management of the risk related to these policies? So let me spend uh, uh, some time on effectiveness. Um, uh, there are two rationale for non-standard measures. The first, uh, and actually, uh, you know, Christine Lagarde uh, talked about it in her introductory remarks, uh, is that central bank intermediation substitutes for private market activity when financial markets size up. The second rationale is the zero lower bound. Once the scope for conventional monetary easing, so the lowering the level of short-term interest rate uh, is exhausted, at the uh, lower bound, uh, then we have to implement uh, measures to ease financial conditions uh, facing the private sector. There are differences between the two. The first emphasizes complementarity between non-standard measures uh, and conventional policy measures. It addresses monetary policy, financial stability, and liquidity policy objectives. The second is viewed as a substitution 
of interest rate policy, and it addresses the macro implications of the financial crisis. There are several examples. Uh, oh, the ECB pre-QE, uh, for example, when uh, you know, the ECB in intervened with new policies, uh, you know, the first long-term refinancing operations uh, replacing, uh, you know, the, the function of the interbank market when the interbank market froze. Uh, that was, in a way, was a balance sheet policy. The balance sheet expanded uh, endogenously because of the increase of reserves uh, um, on the liability side uh, against uh, largely, at the time, conventional assets, repos uh, on the asset side. Uh, various forms of credit easing by the Fed in the first phase, but then also on, on, on the other type, on the substitution type of policy, we have Operation Twist, which involves maturity transformations, and then the recent, uh, uh, you know, Euro, Euro area style asset purchase programs. So in some of these examples, the central bank becomes a market maker by acting as an intermediary uh, between demand and supply, and then in, in that way, the central bank affected the liquidity of the asset. In other, the central bank uh, is like a new investor with an inelastic demand which absorbs risk by swapping risky asset, uh, risky debt securities, with uh, safe reserves. So this is the way how this policies work, and uh, uh, so, you know, with uh, important non-neutrality effects, uh, and, uh, you know, this is the way they are designed. Now, do they work, and what are the mechanisms? Uh, okay, we used to think that this policy could not possibly work, and that, in fact, in a lot of, uh, you know, standard models uh, uh, in economics, uh, you know, there are these irrelevant theories, okay? So this policy, you know, and there is a very uh, famous phrase by Ben Bernanke, this policy, uh, work in practice, they do not work in theory. But, uh, you know, there is now new research uh, which shows that uh, we, if you introduce, um, you know, some form of financial frictions uh, which prevent arbitrage, uh, then, uh, you know, these irrelevance theories, uh, theorem uh, break down. Uh, there are several mechanisms which have been suggested in the literature, compression of risk premium, relaxation of financial constraints in financial intermediaries, etc. Uh, the key mechanism is the compression in spreads, uh, which uh, uh, reduces the borrowing cost of firms uh, and, uh, you know, the borrowing cost of governments, which is particularly relevant uh, when the governments uh, are spending constraints, okay? So these effects are really, you know, typically non-neutral in that, in that uh, and have, obviously, distributional consequences. Uh, I mean, distributional consequence that you can argue also standard monetary policy has, okay? But, uh, you know, so this, uh, you know, with large balance sheet, these are maybe more, you know, evident and sizable. Now, so these are the mechanisms. Now, empirically, there is a question, have they worked? Now, there is a huge literature, mostly uh, done by central bank staff. So, you know, there is a question of whether you know, this literature is uh, really provides an independent point of view. And the literature is a lot of, uh, a, a big chunk of the literature is, is on the U.S. case, but increasingly there is a lot of evidence also uh, from, the, from the euro area case. Now, it is very difficult, of course, in the euro area in particular, uh, to identify, you know, the effect of the various policies. And this is because there have been uh, Quite, a diff quite an instability in the policy regimes and kind of an evolution of the thinking of the ECB and uh, you know, the ability of implementing uh, certain tools, uh, as well as uh, a lot of changes in the euro area governance in the framework, uh, the banking union, uh, you know, the ESM and so on. So a lot of these changes uh, that, act, you know, that were taking place at the same time as, as uh, the, the thinking of the ECB was evolving. However, I think there are a few lessons, and I hear, uh, I mean, I'm not going to give you a review of the literature, of course, uh, but I'm going to give you my personal, very personal reading of the literature. I think there are a few key messages. The first message, um, can I have the first slide, please? I mean, am I, can I? Ah, no, I can do, oh, fantastic, no, because I, Jordi could not do it, so that's okay. Okay, so this is a very famous uh, chart, okay, is the 10-year government bond yield, uh, you know, for different countries. 
And, uh, you know, this chart has been used uh, by many, many presentations. Uh, and, uh, you know, the first message of these charts is that there are multiple equilibria, okay? So, and, uh, you know, the effect of the famous 2012 speech by Mario Daghi has been emphasized by Hall. Oh, so, which tells you that, uh, uh, you know, that uh, there are situations of market turmoil where the communication uh, from the central bank to act, uh, can, act uh, can have a very powerful effect. Here I would like to say something a little bit more than what is typically, uh, you know, said when one, you know, in the literature on multiple equilibrium. And I think here is very interesting to compare the S&P program implemented in 2010 and the OMT or whatever it takes 2012 uh, announcement. Paradoxically, the S&P, there were large purchases uh, implemented under Trichet, while uh, uh, since to, in 2012 there were no purchases, just an announcement. So, and here I think that the big difference uh, is really the way in which uh, uh, these measures were communicated and the extent to which they had the support of governments, which I think leads to a very important uh, point, uh, what is the credibility of, um, and, and therefore effectiveness uh, of uh, central bank action. This is very much uh, uh, related uh, to the fact that there is kind of what I call generically fiscal backing, but means, you know, the support by the political and fiscal authority for a certain number of things. Now, we know that in 2010, the SP was announced as a temporary program. There was a big discussion about the seniority and so on. So that program was not uh, understood as credible by the markets and the spreads, in fact, uh, they had very temporary effect on the spreads. While on the MT, you know, that came with a package and, uh, you know, also with support by Angela Merkel, by the, you know, the beginning of a process of reform, including the banking union and so on. So there was the backing, and this is why I think it worked. It was not just that Mario Draghi, you know, all of a sudden, uh, you know, said, okay, I will commit, because, you know, that it had to come with, uh, you know, a package. The second uh, uh, thing I want to say about multiple equilibria is related by actually some very recent re uh, research by uh, Leon Broni and, and others, uh, which, was, uh, which was recently published, which is instead, uh, um, it's based uh, on uh, a quantitative research uh, um, on uh, forward guidance communication shocks uh, and risk premium shocks, uh, which uh, are uh, extracted by uh, high frequency, um, by, by in uh, high frequency data, um, which uh, are measures uh, uh, as, the, uh, as the effect of communication by, uh, by the central bank. This is a database which has been used also extensively by internal work at the ACB and now has been used uh, you know, by, by research uh, you know, also outside the central bank. I think this paper is interesting uh, uh, and I'm picking up here you know, what I like in the literature uh, because uh, it shows um, that, uh, um, that it shows that communication on regular announcement days uh, increase risk premia, uh, credit risk premia, and amplify sovereign yield volatility during the crisis period. So it actually uh, works in, uh, in the opposite way. So this actually shows that after 2012, so after the, famo the famous whatever it takes, uh, Forward guidance, you know, communication on the negative interest rates, communications on forward guidance was actually read by the market uh, as uh, negative QE, the institutions uh, delaying uh, QE, and therefore it didn't work. Actually, it did have uh, the opposite effect uh, on credit risk. Uh, while after QE, you know, the, the, the sign was reversed, and so the normal, the normal effect, uh, so the announcement started having the, the, um, the effect that they are supposed to have. So it seems here um, that the analysis carried out in the U.S. on communication shocks is not easily importable in the, the euro area situation, exactly because uh, the consensus on uh, what were the policy uh, in the consensus also in the governing council, but you know, in, the, in, the, you know, in Europe in general, on what was 
what, we, what the ECBs was supposed to do and what was not supposed to do kind of evolved over time. And I think there was that period between 2012 and 2015 in which there was a lot of confusion about where the ECB was going. Um, now, the second point, so the first point, as I said, is multiple equilibria. The second point uh, is, uh, that comes in my reading of the literature is that uh, QE actually could be very powerful and could, in certain circumstances, have a large effect on spreads. And there are certain uh, results which I think are robust, which are the large effect on term spreads and credit spreads, and also large effect on exchange rates. While it is much more uh, harder to identify sizable effect uh, on uh, the macro side, on inflation and output. Now, just to have a flavor to, to get an intuition of how powerful they are, uh, how you know, asset purchases are in, um, in, affecting, uh, uh, in affecting spreads, I mean, here is uh, uh, you know, a chart on the PEP announcement, uh, very recent. Uh, you can see on the left uh, uh, the 10-year sovereign yield spreads for different countries. And on the right, uh, uh, the corporate bond yields. So you see how powerful, I mean, this is just a you know, visual, but the, how powerful uh, you know, the, the asset purchases can be. Uh, but again, uh, if we are instead looking at uh, you know, more quantitative work, and again here, work based uh, on uh, these uh, you know, high frequency shocks uh, identified as uh, um, QE shocks, forward gu guidance shocks, uh, which have been the basis of a lot of quantitative res uh, research, I think that uh, um, you know, what, what the results are telling us uh, is that indeed it is true that uh, these are impulse response functions uh, of uh, uh, expansionary QE shocks, uh, so uh, shocks which affect the terms premium and that orthogonal to the shocks that affect the short term rates. So if you look at this chart, um, what I put in a circle is uh, what it comes out robust on all these different specifications. Um, exchange rate, uh, strong uh, negative shock, uh, um, 10, year temp, uh, 10 years rate, uh, shock, uh, uh, very large negative effect. Um, very positive effect uh, on the stock markets, uh, while uh, we can see that uh, uh, the situation on other variables, uh, on inflation and industrial production, is more muted. Uh, and especially, uh, you know, I'm just picking up here one particular uh, paper with one particular chart, but, uh, you know, if you look at uh, the general literature, those macro effects don't seem to be uh, that robust. Okay. So the question here, how come that we have such large effect on spreads uh, and uh, the effect on output and inflation are not uh, as large? Uh, here, I think this is something that still has uh, you know, to be uh, investigated further. Uh, I think my, I have two conjectures. One is what I was saying before, that uh, you know, there are indeed the multiple equilibria. I mean, there are changes in regimes, so th certain things change, you know, work in certain uh, cir circumstances. Credibility is very important. Credibility of the target is important. Uh, credibility of the action in terms of the action being supported more generally by the fiscal authority is important. And so when you do you know, uh, a piece of empirical work uh, on a sample which uh, you know, has uh, this very unstable uh, s kind of uh, situations, uh, then uh, it's difficult uh, to you know, to uh, come out with an average. And the other thing, and, uh, and, the, thir uh, and, and the other conjecture is that um, inflation uh, and even output uh, are dominated by uh, low frequency movement, uh, so that the cyclical variations uh, are very subdued. And here I come to my third point, uh, in which uh, I wanted to show you uh, this chart, uh, which makes the point, that these are the market implied inflation expectations, uh, you see basically that uh, since 2011, uh, you know, the mid-2011, until the end of 2014, before QE was implemented, uh, you have a very persistent decline in inflation. And um, again, uh, I interpret that uh, as missing QE, which is very consistent uh, with what I was saying before about, uh, you know, the, the different regimes. So this is one possibility, you know, the... the the fact that uh, at that point, uh, uh, unlike the first phase of the crisis, uh, 
uh, the euro era was at the zero lower bound, but it hesitated uh, to, um, to implement uh, a program of asset purchases, uh, and actually that was delayed until the beginning of 2015. Another possibility, of course, uh, is uh, hawkish fiscal policy. At the same time, this is also something that uh, actually was mentioned by Lagarde this morning, that uh, um, at the same time uh, as, uh, as monetary policy uh, was, uh, you know, the QE was delayed, uh, we had a uh, very strong fiscal consolidation in the euro area. If you look at uh, the chart uh, here on my right, you have uh, you know, three, three lines. Uh, I'm putting at zero the beginning uh, of uh, different uh, um, recessions. I have the 1980-1982 uh, recession, the 1991 recession, the 2008-2012 recessions. Uh, this is the government, uh, so putting, a, and is an index, putting at zero uh, the deficit to GDP ratio at the beginning of these recessions. Uh, you can see you know, what huge uh, deficit we had in 2008 as a consequence of the collapse in output. Uh, and already on the third quarter of 2019, uh, it was a process of consolidation started with uh, um, not much effect on debt, if you look uh, uh, on, the, on the left, because we know that debt is very persistent. Uh, but this fiscal consolidation during that period uh, uh, most likely uh, had an effect on inflation as well, because as we know, inflation is the result of a combination of monetary and fiscal policy. Mon monetary policy does not act in a vacuum. Now, um, it has been said that, um, that, uh, uh, that actually uh, some of these uh, inflation, long-term trends of inflation uh, uh, are of a global nature. Uh, I want to, uh, it is possible, of course, that low inflation has a big global component, but if we look at, at that period, uh, uh, which is when uh, actually inflation expectation, the, the, the charts I showed you before start declining, so 2011, 2015, uh, uh, so you see that while at the Fed, that's the blue, li the blue line, and that's trend inflation, which uh, uh, I have computed uh, on the basis of a statistical model, but uh, identified with uh, long-term uh, expectations, uh, so data survey expectations. So you see that the Fed has quite a stable inflation trend, while, uh, uh, while the euro area actually starts uh, disconnecting. Uh, and, uh, you know, there is uh, a, a little bit of a reversal with the beginning of QE, but, uh, you know, those years uh, of missing QE uh, were quite uh, important uh, for, uh, for the decline of, of, you know, for this kind of low frequency component of inflation, which is very important for, inf for the credibility of the target, expectations, and so on. So, uh, overall, uh, um, you know, I, have, you know I, I just gave you three facts which I think are important. Of course, as I said, this is not an exhaustive review of the literature. I think there are four messages. One is that, uh, you know, the, what I call fiscal backing with some kind of uh, improper use of the la language uh, or more general government support for non-standard policy is key for effectiveness. Uh, uh, and uh, indeed, not only for no standard policy, but also for, the, for standard policies. The second, uh, and, and here I think what is relevant is the distinction you know, between the effectiveness of the SP and the OMT. Um, the second, uh, but also, uh, also maybe the, the period 2011 and 2015. Um, the second is that, uh, uh, you know, the credibility of the inflation targeting is also important. And, um, and so, you know, this is again, and, you know, this is true for, for all monetary policy, but, uh, you know, you can see that that credibility was lost uh, after 2012. Um, the third uh, lesson, I think, is that uh, um, this policy uh, can be very powerful, provided that they act in a very clear and agreed uh, institutional framework. And they are powerful exactly because they are non-neutral, exactly because they affect the sovereign risk and the credit risk. And this is why they work. So to deny, uh, you know, I mean, so, you know, uh, so, you know, they affect liquidity and they affect risk premium. Uh, 
Uh, and the fourth lesson is that the policy mix is important. Uh, um, uh, it is uh, a very reasonable conjecture to think that uh, while the ECB was implementing those standard policy in a certain period of time, the fiscal authority was undoing that uh, by, uh, by uh, embarking uh, in a very heavy fiscal consolidation. Okay, having said that, uh, you know, uh, what are the risks of this policy? It would be crazy not to deny that they carry some risk. And uh, um, here is a list, okay, of the risk. Um, of course, credit risk, okay. And uh, this credit risk uh, today is mostly sitting in the national central banks, okay. Um, and therefore, you know, there are, there are questions of what would happen if, uh, you know, maybe this is not going to happen, I hope it will not happen, but, uh, you know, we are in a very high debt uh, type of situation. What will happen if, if a country defaults and the, the, the national central banks will, will, uh, will uh, need to be recapitalized and, of course, a defaulting country will not recapitalize its own national central banks. Okay, so what is the implicit risk sharing mechanism that we have in the euro area? Of course, this is the elephant in the room, okay? I'm not saying anything new, but, you know, these risks are there. And, uh, you know, they're particularly large uh, when we have uh, uh, high debt and high large central bank balances. There are also risks of uh, moral hazard, uh, crowding out of market activity, the central bank being overburdened. But, of course, uh, these risks have to be, you know, compared with what would have happened uh, if, uh, uh, if uh, these tools were not used. So my uh, answer is that uh, these tools are powerful, potentially, they are the new normal for the reasons I've described, and uh, there is no way back for the reason I already mentioned. Oh, they are needed for both financial stability and monetary policies, and no central bank in the world will let the euro area go because there is a moral hazard problem, okay? So, you know, at the end, uh, you do what you have to do. So, oh, the question is uh, then, uh, uh, you know, to have an agenda which would recognize uh, uh, the need for monetary policy to be innovative for both monetary and financial stability reasons, or accept that uh, monetary policy may have distributional consequences, accept that the interaction between monetary and fiscal policy is, re is relevant and must be explicitly acknowledged, uh, but also recognize that there are credit and fiscal risk uh, and accept that we cannot go back to the old regime. Therefore, we have to learn how to manage this risk. And uh, here, I mean, this is a completely open uh, question. So wh what, is, what is the risk management approach to balance sheet policies? The first thing that um, comes into mind is, of course, capital. Okay, now Frank Smith just told me why I keep on talking about capital since the, uh, we have a lot of capital. But I think, uh, I mean, this is very important, okay, because, uh, um, I, I mean, this is here is really the relation between the monetary and the fiscal authority. The fiscal authorities need to recognize the fact uh, uh, that uh, if, uh, you know, if, if the ECB, if the, that they will have to provide more capital to the central bank, uh, and this is not uh, a, a one-off one if, if the ECB will continue, you know, to expand balance sheets and to get uh, into, uh, into balance sheet policies. And um, uh, so this is important to support the risk management approach uh, to balance sheet policy, I think. And uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, this is something that requires more thinking. Uh, and also, as I said, uh, what requires more thinking uh, is, uh, okay, what is the relation between the risk which sit in the national central banks uh, and, uh, you know, what is shared uh, at, the level, uh, at the level of, of, of the ECB. Uh, now, uh, of course, uh, also, uh, you know, this, this kind of uh, discussion about uh, uh, capital is not easily achieved with many fiscal authorities. Uh, but, uh, um, uh, so, but, but this is actually necessary. And, uh, uh, and also, this opens the discussion on what is the design of an uh, institutional setup, which is coherent, which can support this policy. And I think here uh, the key issue, and I'm very happy also that Lagarde said it this morning, is the relationship with the fiscal authorities. Uh, um, 
you know, see, the first thing, as I said, is since the ECB provides, uh, through its policy, some amount of resharing, explicit or implicit, uh, this should be matched by fiscal resources. The second principle is that uh, since effectiveness of policies uh, require monetary policy, uh, monetary fiscal policy coordination, or to avoid that the fiscal authorities undo what Q, da, QE does, or vice versa, uh, this should require a counterparty. And uh, ideally, you know, a federal fiscal authority, of course, we don't have it in the euro area, but, uh, you know, we need to reflect. I mean, this discussion is not independent from the discussion of the reform of the governance of the euro area. Um, and also the third thing is that when we reflect on target, I think that both monetary and fiscal policy should commit to a target, uh, inflation target, nominal GDP target, whatever, okay, but uh, we need a target, uh, of course, for the reason that we know. Uh, and uh, I think, uh, you know, the target, um, you know, should be, uh, uh, should be established by the fiscal authority and, uh, and, uh, and uh, the monetary authority should car carry it. Uh, uh, and both uh, fiscal and monetary authorities should commit uh, to this joint target. And I think so in that sense, fiscal authority should be congruent uh, to monetary policy. This uh, is very important for effectiveness of non-standard policy, especially at very high level of, uh, of debt. So in terms of institutional design, um, the big question is it possible to achieve uh, any of this without a fiscal federation? Um, I think, uh, you know, this is really the big question. I think that uh, uh, we are, in a way, de facto, already going in a certain direction to a more monetary fiscal coordination with the new generation uh, um, EU program. Uh, but, uh, you know, we are going there in a kind of disorderly fashion. So I think that uh, we should open that discussion and say, well, maybe the king is naked. The idea of narrow central banking uh, with fiscal rules uh, and uh, the Chinese wall between the monetary authority and the fiscal authorities uh, are probably over. We don't live in the same world as the 90s, uh, and this arrangement uh, is at odd with new reality. Um, so it is actually a difficult problem because we can say- and Lucre Lucrecia, Lucrecia yeah. this is, this is pa Pablo uh, I'm chairing the meeting. Uh, <laughs> I think you have to- to yes, I uh, basically. Because, uh, I yes. Sorry, sorry. I mean, I, I didn't uh, look at my uh, my watch. Okay, so, uh, okay. So uh, uh, that's it. Okay, so this is uh, this is all what I wanted to say. So that the reflection on governance and the institutional framework has to be open in relation to the discussion ongoing on the uh, on the strategy review. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you sorry very much, uh, Lucrecia. Okay. No, no, no. On the contrary, it was very interesting, and I think it, it serves the purpose of framing very well the purpose of this um, of this debate. So I will now give the floor to, to Atanasios to continue with our discussion. Atanasios, please. Uh, thank you, Pablo. It's uh, my, my pleasure to uh, to be at this uh, at this session. And I'm, I'm sorry I cannot be there with you. So I'm joining you from uh, from Boston. Um, so uh, uh, thank you also to to Volker for uh, uh, for inviting me to uh, uh, to to this next slide, please. Um, so the uh, uh, the ongoing uh, policy strategy review is uh, is a unique opportunity for the ECB to uh, uh, examine uh, how to adapt its policies. Uh, Lucrecia just uh, explains very lucidly uh, that uh, you know we're not in the 90s and I would say 80s, 70s. Uh, uh, so we need to adapt the policies beyond the 2003 uh, review. This is a great opportunity. Uh, and uh, the way I saw the, uh, the purpose of the session is to ask, uh, uh, does the ECB have the uh, authority and the instruments to, uh, uh, to do its job uh, in the current circumstances? I'm gonna focus on two challenges. Um, the two challenges we are all aware of, uh, they have come up uh, already uh, in Lucrecia's presentation and earlier. Uh, one is that we are in a uh, in a low uh, interest rate environment, so the traditional policy tools uh, are not really uh, sufficient anymore for central banks. Uh, the second, uh, specific to the uh, to the ECB, is that uh, we have to deal with the incomplete uh, uh, nature of the uh, of the uh, EMU, uh, what Lucrecia referred to as the uh, as the elephant uh, in, in in the room. Now. Uh, 
Uh, I will focus on two things in particular for the ECB uh, that are still unresolved uh, from, uh, from the euro crisis. One is uh, what the uh, IMF uh, called uh, the uh, ECB's loflation problem. Uh, uh, and uh, I, I agree with Lucrezia there. I will, I will show you in, in a minute as well. This is really uh, uh, related to uh, the reluctance of the ECB to, to do what other central banks uh, were doing uh, for a few years uh, in the middle of the, uh, of the decade. So this is very closely related to policy. The second one I will, uh, I will focus on is the impairment of the monetary policy transmission uh, uh, mechanism, which relates to uh, the way Lucrezia put it is multiple equilibria. This is one very useful way of, of, of looking at it. Uh, but other ways of looking at it is, uh, is to examine what exactly are the implementation aspects of monetary policy strategy that uh, uh, might be uh, more or less uh, uh, useful. Uh, next slide, please. Now, uh, next slide, please. So Volker, Volker will, uh, will, will forgive me in that I will, uh, I will actually uh, uh, relate uh, my, uh, my remarks on, 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 on two pieces uh, that were written 20 years apart from each other. The first is, uh, uh, is, uh, is, 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 is a paper that uh, Volker and I worked on 20 years ago for the Japanese zero lower bound problem. Uh, and frankly, at the time, uh, I thought uh, we had the answers uh, that you, know, uh, you are at the zero lower bound, do quantitative easing, do it appropriately, do it promptly, do it fast enough, and you don't have a problem. And uh, it has proven to be quite a bit more complicated, as we've seen in the last decade. The second one is, uh, is a recent study uh, I've, I've completed with uh, Ivan Leonwiller from the University of Basel for the European Parliament. Uh, on the uh, 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 on options for the ECB's uh, monetary policy strategy uh, review. Next slide, please. So let me start with uh, with a, with a piece uh, uh, Walter and I did uh, uh, 20 years ago. Uh, it was a very simple-minded uh, 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 question: What do you do when uh, you can no longer uh, affect the uh, economy uh, and inflation? with the interest rate because uh, you are at the zero lower bound and you're faced with a recession. And the answer we, uh, uh, we found in a very, very simple uh, dynamic uh, uh, optimal control problem was that's not really a major issue. Yes, it's costly to have the zero lower bound. What you need to do is switch promptly to quantitative easing because quantitative easing actually does also influence the economy. And there are a couple of issues with it. Number one, uh, the multipliers associated with quantitative easing policy are more uncertain. This is why you would prefer not to do it if you are not at the, at the zero lower bound. And uh, 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 number two, the risks of these policies are asymmetric. So what's the right thing to do? Well, as we had, as we had already pointed out back then, you need to substitute quantitative easing policies at the zero lower bound, and you actually need to do it even before you hit the zero lower bound. So you need to act very promptly in order to minimize uh, the problem that uh, unfortunately we saw later on after we wrote this paper, Bank of Japan did fall into its trap uh, and, and more recently, the ACB did fall into the trap of, of not acting soon enough and, uh, and allowing uh, loflation to take hold. Next slide, please. So you will see in a, in a comparison of the Fed and the, uh, uh, and, and the ACB that uh, um, my interpretation of what the Fed had been doing the last uh, uh, dozen years is that they pretty much did substitute quantitative easing for rate cuts fairly systematically to try to achieve uh, they are 2% inflation objectives. So when they hit zero, they, uh, they actually expanded the balance sheet. We see it both after the 2008 crisis and also in spades, $3 trillion uh, in, uh, since, uh, uh, since, uh, since March of this, uh, of this year. By contrast, uh, the ACB has been relatively timid, and this is the middle of the decade uh, uh, problem that Lucrezia pointed out. You will see from 2012 to 2015, the ECB actually shrank its balance sheet by, by one third. That was a significant quantitative tightening that worked across purposes with, uh, with stabilizing the euro economy. And uh, this actually is what led to the loflation problem that I show you in the next slide. Next slide, please. So uh, since uh, 2012, 
uh, we, uh, we can observe the data uh, and, uh, uh, and counting, I don't have this month's uh, data in, in this chart, but as of last month, uh, inflation on average in the euro area has been only 1.1%. And the question is, what exactly is, uh, is the ECB's inflation uh, goal? And this is one of the uh, uh, most important elements that uh, in my view need to be clarified with the policy review. What exactly is the goal? This is an unfortunate consequence of the ambiguity that, uh, uh, that was left uh, in the quantitative definition uh, that was adopted in, uh, in 1998 and then, and then clarified in, uh, in 2003. I have to say, and this I'm gonna echo what uh, uh, Christian Noyer told us, told us earlier. Christian reminded us uh, Jean-Claude Trichet was referring to effectively implicitly the ECB's inflation goal as, uh, uh, as 1.96. I remember very vividly the average he would repeat in his speeches in 2011. And indeed, during the great financial crisis and the early stages of the Euro, of the Euro crisis, the ECB benefited tremendously from the fact that uh, it kept communicating the implicit symmetric goal of 1.9 to 2% without actually having clearly explicitly adopted it this is what the policy was and this is actually what protected the euro area at the time since then um, the ecb followed inflation policies and uh, and uh, we we face the consequences of that next slide please as uh, um, as was shown already uh, earlier we have a disanchoring of inflation expectations now this actually has happened precisely and during this period of, of what lucrecia mentioned to us that missing quantitative easing. And what's the unfortunate thing about this is that uh, the ECB communicated in 2014-2015 uh, with QE that they recognized the problem, but they did not actually follow up with action. So uh, quantitative easing uh, that started in 2015 uh, was too timid and uh, was discontinued, as you can see from this chart, before actually sufficient progress was done on, uh, on inflation uh, expectations. Next slide, please. Now I want to compare with the Fed. This is core inflation for the Euro area and the, uh, and the United States annual data. And uh, here I want to reiterate two points. First of all, the adverse shocks on inflation have commonalities with other central banks, even in the case of the Federal Reserve, in my case it's the, it's the black line. Um, uh, inflation has been somewhat um, below the, uh, uh, below the 2% uh, the objective. However, the fact that the, uh, the Federal Reserve has communicated a clear 2% target helped their policy be more effective and contained uh, uh, inflation being only a couple of tenths uh, below, the, uh, uh, below the target compared to the, to the ACB. That's effectively about one percentage point uh, below the target. But let me show you with one example from the pandemic how much difference it makes to have clarity on what you're trying to do. Next slide, please. So what I'm, going, what I'm showing you this chart is a comparison of uh, uh, Q4 to Q4 uh, inflation uh, data. And I have in the, in the green dashed line uh, on the left uh, panel, the uh, FOMC's uh, uh, projection of inflation. And you can see because the Fed does have a clear 2% objective and they can communicate with their proje projections that they will ease policy as appropriate to reach their objective. They do that, and this is how inflation expectations are anchored. In the case of the ACB, what I have in the uh, what I have on the right on the right hand side, on the right hand side uh, uh, panel, you will see that the lack of objective actually even before the crisis had inflation very gradually uh, rising, uh, as if there was no clear target in place. And this makes a huge difference if you're hit with a shock as we are facing right now. You can see, for example, if, we, if you check the red line, the red dashed line, which are the September projection, that in the case of the Federal Reserve, already the Fed's projection for 2023 is back to target, despite the very severe shock we have. If you compare this with the ECB's projection for the euro area, it's as if uh, uh, inflation is, is moving up and down sideways without any clarity on where the ECB is going. It makes a big difference to be clear on the inflation objective. And in my view, the sooner the, uh, the, the ECB actually moves in the direction of, of at least clarifying that aspect of, of policy, the better. So next slide, please. Question I'm gonna come back to is, does the ECB have 
the tools to do its job. This, this actually comes up all the time in the legal analysis. Uh, we have these questions about whether, whether uh, the ACB can buy outright and so forth. And I, I just want to, I, I'm not going to read what I have on the slide here, but I just want you to have a look at, at what the ECB statute has in terms of the authority of the ECB. Uh, Article 18 of the statute, uh, uh, in my view, gives more than enough uh, authority to the ECB to do its job. I want to highlight two things that are important. First of all, purchases, no doubt, even in foreign currency, if the ECB wants to. The second one, the ECB actually has the most flexible system and the most discretionary authority of any central bank I know of to define its collateral policy and define what is aggregate collateral, which is how it can do credit operations. So the power is there. And if you think that's not enough, just have a look at what, uh, at what Article uh, 20 of the, of the statute says. What I have highlighted there in the corner is that the Governing Council can actually adopt new measures that most other central banks don't have at their, at their disposal as it sees fit. The ECB has more discretionary authority, more tools to do its job than any other central bank I know of. So it's really a question of whether it's using these tools effectively, whether the policy strategy that was adopted in uh, 98 and 2003 are really suitable for the present time. Next slide, please. So second issue I want to highlight, uh, because uh, I, I think I've already convinced you that uh, that the ACB does have the tools to, to address the lawflation problem uh, if it wants to. Second issue is, uh, is trickier, and this has to do with the impairment of the monetary policy transmission mechanism. Uh, this is a chart that shows you the uh, spreads of the two-year sovereign yields from, from OIS rates uh, in, uh, in major economies. You can see the United States, you can see Japan, and for the euro area, just the, large, the four largest countries, Germany, France, Italy, Spain, we did not have a problem with this, with the transmission monetary policy in the euro area until the euro crisis. We did not. Policy was working just fine. Something went wrong with the euro crisis. And unfortunately, as you can see from this chart, the ECB still has not managed to address it satisfactorily. So this, I believe, is, uh, is, the, uh, is the most important aspect uh, beyond clarifying the price stability target that the ECB needs to address in its policy uh, review. Next slide, please. The, uh, the issue is that uh, the ECB's uh, uh, monetary policy implementation uh, framework effectively relies excessively on private credit rating agencies, which is unlike any other central bank I know of, uh, frankly. And uh, you know, not something that the treaty says the ECB should do. This is a purely discretionary decision of the ECB to adopt this uh, this, this framework, and uh, also excessive reliance to market rates, not recognizing in the framework when it was put together uh, what Lucrezia was describing to us uh, before: the fact that well, in some markets you need to worry about. Uh, uh, multiple equilibria, and when you have multiple equilibria and some are worse than others, central bank needs to actually act in order to make sure that the better of these multiple equilibria uh, prevail. So this has inadvertent consequences, and we've seen them in spades since the uh, euro crisis. Uh, uh, one very important one is that the ECB inadvertently has been inducing rollover crisis in, in sovereign debt. Multiple episodes uh, since, uh, uh, since the global financial crisis. This, of course, does relate to the fact that after the global financial crisis, we had some episodes of fiscal stress. But the episodes of fiscal stress we've seen in the euro area were not really that different from episodes of fiscal stress we've seen in any other advanced economy. And only in the euro area, because of the peculiarity of the ECB's framework, we've seen these problems with rollover crisis uh, coming and going all the time. Uh, and the other issue uh, that, again, relating to, to Lucrezia's point on, on, on the expect multiple expectation equilibria is that inadvertently, by relying on credit rating agencies and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, just market prices without without focusing on fundamentals, the ECB is inadvertently validating adverse expectational equilibria in, in sovereign markets. So this, I think, is, is deserves some, some focus. Uh, 
And I'm going to put it in the form of a question. Has the ACB made satisfactory use of the authority delegated to it uh, to address this, these issues uh, since the euro crisis? Frankly, no. I think that's pretty clear cut. Since the start of the pandemic, well, I think this is this is a new thing. What we've observed since since March actually gives us uh, uh, it gives us uh, the opportunity to see how much power the ACB in a different light. Next slide, please. And, and here I want to I want to highlight a couple of the decisions have been, that have been taken in the uh, in the last uh, few months uh, uh, and uh, and their importance. Now uh, this is I have in this chart the uh, uh, ten year yields uh, and the OIS rate uh, for uh, for again the four largest member member states uh, in the uh, in the euro area. And uh, you know we know the, the the crisis response started with the mishap on uh, on, on March 12th, but not here to close the spreads. But I have to give a lot of credit to the to the ACB Governing Council and and to President Lagarde actually for clarifying right away uh, that that this this statement should not be misconstrued. And I want to highlight two things that happened since then. Number one the PEP program on, on 18 March. Uh, uh, Lucrezia already mentioned that. It was also mentioned in the previous panel. Was it really the most effective element uh, of, uh, of policy? I, I, think, I think the asset purchases are, are extremely important. But as you can see from this chart, it did not actually resolve the market tensions. Even though it was effective, you know, within, uh, within a few weeks, uh, yields actually started going up. So what did stop the market tensions? It was actually the decision on the 22nd of April, when the Governing Council decided to temporarily suspend the role of private credit rating agencies from its collateral framework, grandfather the eligibility of assets that were there, effectively provide collateral certainty. By doing that, the ECB took away uh, role of the risk uh, until uh, September of, of next year, and this is what finally uh, stabilized markets in the euro area. Next slide, please. So, what needs to be done? Uh, well, in the context of the uh, uh, of the policy of the policy uh, review, um, I think it's pretty clear uh, that uh, the, the ACB has the tools uh, and uh, uh, to to address uh, some of the policies better. It's pretty clear. We've seen it from the from the from the reaction to the pandemic um, that. Uh, better policies can be implemented with just slight tweaking of, uh, of policies. What I would point out, however, is that, is that I, think it's, I think to limit the lasting damage from the pandemic, the improvement of the ECB's monetary policy strategy is a matter of urgency. So personally, I'm somewhat worried when I hear statements such as, uh, well, we're going to have to wait until, let's say, September of next year before the thorough examination of the policy review uh, uh, actually uh, 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 allows the ECB to, to move forward. This, I think, is, is, is quite dangerous. Uh, the ECB put in place temporary measures uh, in, uh, in the last uh, a few months, and, and I think we need to, to, um, to, to follow them up with permanent fixes. Next slide, please. And this is my, this is my last uh, uh, slide. I actually see two urgent matters. In order to make uh, the current policy easy, more effective, it's very important for the ECB to clarify, adopt a 2% uh, symmetric inflation goal. If you actually check the history of the ECB, Garden Council was this close to adopting a 2% symmetric objective back in 1998. Think of how much grief we would not have right now if that decision was taken at the time. Why it was not taken? Well, it turns out inflation was somewhat too low uh, for that decision because of the Asian and Russian financial crisis. Just think about the lingering effect of the Asian and Russian financial crisis through that uh, decision. I think the ECB can adopt the 2% target, focus on anchoring inflation expectations in line with, uh, with 2%, with, in line with the 2% goal. Focus on inflation expectations is critical, as was reiterated in, in President Lagarde's uh, talk this, this morning. Uh, in my view, uh, the ECB would help its cause by also providing uh, ECB and Governing Council projections of inflation uh, along the lines of what other central banks uh, are, uh, are doing uh, in order to buttress its commitment in a rule-like fashion to keep inflation moving towards uh, 2%. Second element, 
equally important, actually more important uh, in the current circumstances, is to correct the fragility-inducing aspects of the ACB's policy implementation uh, strategy. And I think here, the ACB only needs to simply draw on the success of the temporary measures that have been adopted uh, in response to the pandemic. And first thing is to eliminate the cliff effects in, in the collateral framework on a permanent basis, as opposed to the temporary basis that has been done now. And of course, end the delegation of, of policy implementation to private credit rating agencies. It's fine, to, you know, it's not a joke. It's a serious matter, matter that the ECB has actually delegated uh, critical aspects of its monetary policy to firms that are not even based in the euro area, you know, it's kind of US and, uh, and, and Canada. This is not a laughing matter. matter. This is something that actually has affected adversely uh, the citizens of the, of, the, of, the, of, of the union and the ECB can do a better job simply by adjusting its policy strategy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Athanasios. Uh, as usual, very clear, uh, also potentially controversial uh, presentation. Um, you've made the, many of the points uh, before, uh, so let's, uh, let's wait for the, for the discussion later to see the, the reaction. Uh, let's now move to, to Claudio. Uh, Claudio, please, uh, you have the floor. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Pablo. And I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me again here. It's, uh, it's a big pleasure to, to be here. Now, this session is about the ECB's toolkit for normal and crisis times. Uh, I hope you'll excuse me if I not, do not really speak about the ECB specifically, but about central banks in general. Of course, some of the points I will be making are relevant to the ECB too. After briefly retracing the extraordinary monetary journey since the great financial crisis, I would like to focus on three issues, the lessons, the caveats, and the challenges. The bottom line is that there are tough policy challenges ahead and the answers remain elusive. So let me recap the journey. I think it's a sign of the extraordinary times we live in that the central bank tools for normal and crisis times are increasingly difficult to tear apart. In the old days, the picture was quite simple. In normal times, central banks would steer the market overnight rate within a positive range. Liquidity management operations would work very much in the background. They would be designed purely to steer that rate and carried no signal whatsoever about the stance of policy. By contrast, in crisis times, central banks would actively use their balance sheet in order to stabilize financial markets and, and institutions, typically through emergency liquidity assisting, largely to banks. Now, one possible exception to this neat distinction, at least some central banks, in particular in emerging market economies, relied quite a lot on foreign exchange intervention, which is a type of balance sheet policy in all but name. And then came the great financial crisis, which appended the simple world. Uh, central banks, in the wake of the crisis, started using very actively their balance sheet in order to spur aggregate demand, given the proximity of the effective lower bound. The balance sheet became a key tool to set the monetary policy stance, hence the large-scale purchases of public and private securities and in the euro area, of course, of public sector securities of varying degrees of credit risk, and hence also special subsidized lending schemes for banks. In addition, central banks began to rely heavily on forward guidance, extending it way into the future as a quasi-commitment device. And last but not least, some of them, some of them also pushed interest rates into negative territory, something that was historically unprecedented and would simply have been unthinkable until then. The cross-country differences that do exist do not invalidate this general picture. The response to the COVID-19 crisis is yet another step along that path. Central banks have done more in terms of both scope and amounts, including providing direct support to firms of lower credit quality, and more central banks have done so notably in emerging market economies in the form of large-scale purchases of government securities, mainly to stabilize markets. 
In the process, central banks have crossed a number of red lines, and they have done so with their eyes wide open. Emergency times, of course, call for emergency measures. And we have described and analyzed this in detail in our latest annual report, annual economic report, that came out in June. Looking forward, if the post great financial crisis experience is anything to go by, it is not inconceivable that some of these tools will become part of the standard toolkit. Now for the lessons. Arguably, unconventional monetary policies have been much more successful than generally expected. I still remember the debates over whether large-scale purchases of government securities would actually succeed in reducing long-term yields. Uh, the Fed would uh, try to look back and find clues in the previous experience with Operation Twist, for example. And then, sort of repeating what Lucrezia said before, came Bernanke's famous quip. QE works in practice, but it doesn't work in theory. So now we know the instruments can have a substantial impact on financial conditions. And financial conditions are the key channel through which monetary policy influences economic activity. During the COVID-19 crisis, we saw just how powerful unconventional monetary policy instruments can be. Through shock and awe tactics, not only did their forceful and large-scale deployment stabilize markets, it also triggered a strong market rally. As a result, risky asset prices are now broadly in line with pre-crisis levels. And in, indeed, on occasions, they have been above those levels, to the point that a number of market observers have raised the question as to whether financial market valuations are disconnected from economic reality. And indeed, we looked in, into this in detail in our uh, BIS quarter review that came out in September. Now, looking further back, I think there is little question that central banks' accommodated monetary stance was instrumental in supporting economic activity and the economic recovery post the GFC in what proved to be extremely challenging circumstances. Now, the caveats. The caveat is that nothing is a panacea or council free. And let me here highlight just a couple of points. First point, there are grounds to believe that the tools exhibit diminishing effectiveness. After all, and without going into details, I think there are limits to how far interest rates can be lowered and credit spreads compressed. And the compression of banks' net interest margins can weaken banks' lending capacity in the longer term, even if in the short term it was asset quality. Indeed, some preliminary work, indeed very preliminary work, underway with colleagues, finds evidence of diminishing returns in the impact on economic activity with respect to the level of interest rate. I think that the impact with respect to the duration of low interest rates is another aspect that deserves attention. Second point, there is a consensus that while effective, the tools have limitations. Again, without going into details, let me just highlight four issues. First, unusually easy financial conditions can spur excessive risk taking. No doubt some of the financial vulnerabilities outside banks that prevailed pre-crisis, pre-pandemic crisis, and that amplified this damage were in part due to the unusually easy and prolonged accommodative conditions that prevailed pre-pandemic. Second, unusually easy financial conditions can sap the resilience of financial intermediaries, not just banks, but also insurance companies and pension funds. Third, they may contribute to the misallocation of resources, largely, I would say, by um, softening budget constraints. And fourth, they may risk tricky political economy questions, uh, not least for the relationship between the central bank and the government. The risk of financial dominance and loss of autonomy, I think, are material. And again, we discuss this in detail in the annual economic report. The real debate is about the strength of these effects, how long it may take for them to materialize, and how far they can be effectively addressed through other policies, other means, not least macroprudential measures. And now for the challenges. The challenges follow from the caveats. The wide-ranging and forceful measures necessary to contain the economic damage of the pandemic have further narrowed 
the policy will maneuver. An economy with small margins, safety margins, is exposed and vulnerable. That's why policies in non-economic areas explicitly build in those margins. Think of transport, health, energy, and so on. Arguably, the challenge of the decade ahead will be to rebuild policy buffers, prudential, fiscal, and monetary. So to be absolutely clear, withdrawing policy accommodation, which is the first step in that process, is not for today, tomorrow, or even the day after tomorrow. The economy will require support for quite some time. Moreover, there is a natural concern that even talking about withdrawal could reduce the effectiveness of the policies in place by sapping confidence. But at some point, as soon as conditions allow, disengagement will be called for. Starting the debate now can get markets and economic agents more generally ready for it. Now, at that point, rebuilding policy buffers will be a major challenge. Let me briefly elaborate with reference to the case of monetary policy, which is what we're discussing today. In order to succeed in normalizing, monetary policy will need to address two issues. One is economic and the other is intellectual. The economic issue is well known and fully appreciated. That is the limited responsiveness of inflation to monetary policy that has prevailed for so long across the world. Especially since the great financial crisis, many central banks, including those in lead economies, have tried very hard to push inflation back to target, and many have failed. Two factors underline the difficulties central banks have faced. First, inflation has proved very unresponsive to economic slack. That is, as President Lagarde mentioned, the, uh, the Phillips curve has proved to be very flat, and indeed, I would say, hard to estimate, to the point that in its recent review, the Fed has downplayed the role of an unobservable equilibrium rate of unemployment in setting policy. Second, there is an increasing recognition that inflation expectations are rather backward-looking. This is indeed one reason why central banks are very concerned when inflation remains persistently below target. The concern is that inflation expectations may become unanchored. Economic agents are convinced only by outcomes, not so much by announcements. Looking ahead, the picture is unlikely to change significantly. These inflationary pressures will probably prevail for quite some time. From a cyclical perspective, economies may well operate persistently below full capacity. Above all, from a secular perspective, some of the forces that have weakened the bargaining power of labor and the pricing power of firms are still with us. And again, these were referred to in President Lagarde's presentation. Globalization, albeit somewhat in retreat, technology, which is in full swing, and demographics, which is a force that is very slow moving. Now, the intellectual challenge is possibly less well appreciated. The main element here is the prominence of the notion of the natural rate of interest. That is, that real interest rate that is fully independent of monetary policy and that defines equilibrium in the goods market. This notion, in effect, puts central banks in a straitjacket. It implies that the only way to gain policy room is to raise inflation so that nominal interest rates can increase alongside it. This means that central banks have no option but to cut rates is monetary policy today if they want to raise them tomorrow. Thus, paradoxically perhaps, to gain policy headroom on a sustainable basis tomorrow requires lowering it today. This notion is especially powerful when coupled with the view that the long-term side effects of unusually and persistently easy monetary policy are not significant or are effectively managed through other policies. Now, in some respects, this view about the side effects is not surprising. The costs of failing uh, to rebuild buffers are not highly visible, either ex ante, as they materialize only over the long term, or ex post, as it will be hard to attribute the costs, for example, financial vulnerabilities, notably higher debt, private and public, as well as lower growth, to previous monetary policy decisions. 
But these vulnerabilities do weaken the economy's ability to withstand high rates, something that I refer to as a debt trap. And in the case of public debt, as was mentioned repeatedly during this event, they can give rise to challenges to central bank independence and credibility. Now, the implication is straightforward. Um, with inflation rather unresponsive to monetary policy, the risk of depleting buffers is material. And I think that the post-GFC experience confirms this. Now, what does all this mean for policy? I would suggest that it points to the need for a broader view. We need to recognize the limits of monetary policy, as well as the importance of flexibility in the framework, which allows sufficient weight to be placed on the longer term factors over which monetary policy has a significant influence. And I would say that financial factors and debt and the like play a key role here. And we need to think of what other policies can do. Hence the need to ensure that in those policies too, buffers are in place. This applies both to prudential and fiscal policies. Pre-existing buffers in both areas have been instrumental in enabling the needed policy support in the wake of the COVID-19 crisis. Strong bank capital and liquidity buffers have allowed supervisors to encourage banks to keep credit flowing. And those countries with higher fiscal headroom have been able to respond more forcefully to support the economy. At some point, though, there will be a need to rebuild those buffers. This is true for banks, as the crisis transitions from the liquidity to the solvency phase. And it is true for fiscal policy, as it is imperative that it remains on a sustainable path, which, as we know, is essential for financial, macroeconomic, and price stability. Last but not least, while policy buffers promote badly needed economic resilience, the key to more robust and sustainable growth is structural reform. Unfortunately, after a brief phase post-GFC, they have lost momentum. The current crisis offers an unexpected opportunity to regain it. So to conclude, building policy buffers is essential in monetary policy, just as in other areas. The challenge ahead is how to do it. After all, if something is valuable, it must be worth paying a certain price for it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carl. You are useful, very structured, and uh, it's a lot of suspense uh, intervention. So um, we are running out of uh, time. But my proposal would be that uh, we go for, for questions. We accumulate uh, two or three questions, uh, and then I give the floor to our speakers um, to try to, to answer those questions and also to comment uh, on uh, the other's uh, intervention, uh, if, you, if you agree. So I have uh, three people in, uh, in my list. Uh, first is uh, Katharina Uttermel. Um, Governor de Coos, let's, uh, okay, sh should I read the question? We have um, these three questions, plus also yes. a question from Honorary Governor um, Noyer from here. Okay. So I'll just read it. Dual rates are hailed as a wonder weapon thanks to fewer legal and political concerns attached while promising endless room for maneuver and strong targeting, green TL2RO. How would you recalibrate this policy tool? What is TL2RO's R star? Should the ECB concerned, be concerned about fueling risky lending? So next question. Next question is by Ulrich Cutter. Yeah. More and more market participants are concerned about side effects of unconventional policy instruments, high asset prices, low risk premia, and high debt levels. The regime of low inflation may change again over the coming years. What are the main challenges in unwinding the current instruments? And the next question from Yari Steen. Policymakers have provided unprecedented stimulus during the COVID crisis but central banks with positive policy rates have not entered negative territory and ones with negative rates have kept them on hold. Has there been a reassessment of negative rates and what are the implications for the ECB? Uh, from Yari Steen and um, Governor Noyer, do you want to add your question? You can speak and we show the video. Um. Um, uh that works. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's, it's very much linked to with with the last question. My, my, uh, how do you assess the uh, compatibility of negative interest rates and asset purchases? Uh, to make it clear, 
if, if the central bank does asset purchases, it injects liquidity, huge amounts of liquidity. Uh, this liquidity comes back to banks. There is no, nobody can, can reduce that liquidity except the central bank itself. So it comes into reserves. The reserves then, if they are at negative interest rates, either has the, they have the consequence of lowering the capital base of the central bank, then the central bank, uh, then, then the, 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 the having lower capital base, they, they have to take less risk or to lend less, which is contrary to the objective of the central bank, or they transmit uh, this uh, sort of tax to uh, the cost of credit, and then the cost of credit will be higher. So in both cases, uh, it seems to me to be, to be negative. How do you see the compatibility? Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, um, if you agree, we can start again with uh, Lucrecia. Lucrecia, you choose uh, the question that you want to answer. And uh, since this will be also your final intervention, because we are running out of time, if you want to react to any of the comments uh, made by Atanasios or, or Claudio, uh, please, please do, do, do so now. Thank you. Well, I mean, one question was about uh, um, risky lending. Uh, I mean, I think one should have an approach, uh, an overall approach about the risk of, uh, you know, the policy package. And, uh, of course, uh, uh, on the TLTRO, one could argue that, uh, you know, sometimes indirectly the ECB, uh, you know, kind of supported the uh, institutions uh, that uh, were close to insolvency and so you know this is a problem and we know that uh, you know in real time it's uh, difficult uh, to 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 discriminate between uh, liquidity and solvency so i think this is uh, something that should be addressed uh, with different tools so the the monetary policy does liquidity in principle or, uh, you know, the, 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 the uh, financial stability authorities uh, uh, and uh, does uh, the solvency. So I think it's a, it's a problem of policy mix. You could argue that uh, actually uh, interest rate policy as well uh, implies risk. For example, uh, you know, QE uh, decreases risk if the problem in the market uh, is too much maturity transformation from, from, uh, from, the, uh, from the financial sectors or because it compresses the spread, so it kind of withdraws that risk, while conventional monetary policy actually increases that risk. So I think that if one starts tracking risk, uh, it, it's a very complex uh, thing, and therefore one should have a risk management approach to this risk and uh, a set of policies uh, that are coherent. Okay, thank you, Lucrecia. Uh, Atanasios? Uh, thank you, Pablo. Uh, first, uh, uh, just just a sentence uh, responding to one of the uh, uh, many things that, uh, that Claudio said. And, uh, uh, I'm going to start by saying that, uh, of course, I agree that uh, there are side effects to quantitative uh, easing as there are to uh, any other monetary policy that we need to take uh, to take seriously. The challenge is not to let the side effects uh, 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 keep, our, keep our eye away from the ball and effectively uh, uh, let inflation move away from price stability, uh, let millions, hundreds of millions of people go unemployed because the central bank is uh, worried to do its job and, uh, and is overwhelmed by, by side effects. That's not good policy. Good policy is to recognize the side effects and see how to respond to them in a systematic fashion. I'm going to connect this with the question on how do you unwind QE? In my view, the key is to have a systematic monetary policy. This is what, this is what Voltaire and I were trying to, to describe in our paper uh, for the Bank of Japan 20 years ago. If you cannot do interest rate policy, you can do quantitative easing in a systematic fashion. I mean, we could even envision simple policy rules that have uh, um, quantitative easing respond directly to the shortfall uh, of uh, uh, inflation from the target. And of course, the unwinding will automatically come as the target is, is achieved and as incipient, as incipient inflation rises above the target. If a central bank uh, follows a rule, is systematic, it can actually be politically protected and defend its policy 
much, much uh, better. Uh, one more thing I would like to, com to comment on is this, this relates to Christian's question and also the question on dual interest rates and so forth. So there are fiscal consequences of any monetary policy decision. I know central banks just don't like to talk about them, but they're there everywhere. Uh, negative interest rates, if they are implemented to be effective, do have do have effectively a fiscal component that would depress uh, the capital of the uh, of, of the central bank. You can do dual interest rate. The idea was mentioned. You can do dual interest rate to have effective monetary policy in different sectors, uh, if you uh, uh, if you wish. Similar to the idea of tiering of, of of reserves. The problem is that if you look at these policies, they have a fiscal component and a monetary component. And we need to realize that there is only so much fiscal element that the central bank can do on its own. It would be better to focus on the monetary policy component and uh, effectively tell the governments that there is fiscal policy that needs to be to be complemented. My last point is that fiscal and monetary policy, of course, have to be better coordinated, especially uh, in, a, uh, in, a, in, a, in an environment with, with, uh, with a zero dollar bound, when really it's, it's, uh, there, are, there are common elements to what fiscal policy can do and what monetary policy can do uh, that are very different from, uh, from what we were used to in a high interest rate environment 20, 30 years ago. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Atanasios. Uh, Claudio, you want to, to finish with this panel? You have the yes, last thank word. You. Thank you, uh, Pablo. Just uh, some very, very quick points on, on the various things that uh, have been raised. Um, first of all, uh, just to comment on uh, what I heard from Atanasios and uh, also from Lucrezia. My sense is that, uh, and in particular with respect to the so called missing QV, but QE more generally, um, I know that uh, people tend to say that that has been one key reason why inflation, for example, has been lower than it should have been at the targets. But if you look across the world, um, inflation is a target across many, many countries. And despite efforts to bring it up, and regardless whether the central banks there were at the zero lower bound, uh, whether they were going to be, they were not going to be, and so on. So my sense is that the problems run the are, are deeper than just whether one does uh, keep the or doesn't do it at the right time. With regards to the question of the cost of policies, um, I think that there has been a shift. I remember, including talking with Africans many years ago, the idea at the beginning was that these policies were free lunch. I think that now people understand that they are not a free lunch, but of course there are differences in views about how important these uh, uh, side effects are. And here, let, let me just try uh, these side effects are, can be quite sizable, but only in the longer term, not so much in the short term. And this sort of ties in also with the question of unwind the measures and how difficult this is going to be. Um, for example, well, if there are emergency measures, I think it's easier. You can basically say this was just an emergency measure. It was always supposed to be an emergency measure. The emergency has passed and it will lift it. At least in the theory, that is going forward. But when it, when it comes to the costs and the benefits, as I said, one of the key costs is precisely, apart from actually losing from a number over time, is the fact that as the situation persists, it's going to be how the mine falls. And for example, uh, the financial markets are going to become quite dependent on this policy and therefore are going to be very sensitive to any hint that they are being withdrawn. We saw some of that in the recent uh, last couple of years. Um, same goes with that. To the extent that Policies encourage accumulation, and I think that there is agreement around the table about that. Even to the point that actually they are there in order to allow people to borrow, also government to borrow. And when you want to exit, the economy is naturally going to be more sensitive to higher interest rate, which is going to make it difficult to raise rates. Uh, uh, Claudio, uh, there's something wrong with your sound. I mean, we have uh, a hard time. I think the sound is not coming through properly. 
Can you hear okay. me? Yes, I can hear you, but I don't know what to do about my sound. <laughs> Um, I, was, I was listening him well, so it seems that it depends on the connection. It was better before. Uh, Madrid, Madrid connection is working. Is it working now? Yes. Yes, okay. that's better. Uh, uh, I don't know where you stopped uh, uh, hearing well what I was saying, but um, do, would you like me to repeat something, or is it? Uh, no, just just summarize now. I think what the, uh, the last points. Okay, well, the last points, let me just say about the costs and the benefits. The, the costs are only, emerge only longer term, and they have to do with the fact that some of the actions that you're doing are also making exit harder as, you, as time goes on, because you're contributing to those conditions that make that exit harder. I mentioned, for example, the fact that financial markets tend to become quite dependent on, the four, on, on those policies, and therefore very sensitive to any sign that those policies are going to be withdrawn. Think of this as a form of financial, uh, of financial uh, lack of <laughs> financial uh, dominance, if you like, as opposed to fiscal dominance. That's just financial dominance. But this is also true for debt in general, and therefore also for fiscal debt. These, key pol these policies are designed to encourage more power. They are designed to encourage the devil to build up for good reasons. But then when you try to get out of the policies and you raise interest rates, because that has accumulated in the meantime, it's going to be, uh, the economy is going to be more sensitive to any withdrawal. Reassessments of negative interest rates. Well, yes, there are differences of views across the world. Central banks see it differently. So it is not a, uh, again, uh, there is no uh, consensus over how effective these are. And no one picked up on the points that um, uh, President Noyer was, uh, was making before Governor Noyer. I would say that the, the impact of QE, um, which by that I mean also buying long-term assets and allowing reserves to build up, the main impact is on the asset side. The, the fact that you're actually bringing the bond yields down. On the liability side, yes, maybe if markets are actually quite, uh, there's quite a lot of tension in markets, then having excess reserves can actually help the banks. Uh, but otherwise, yes, the two mechanisms that you mentioned are present. Um, they consume capital, and that, that is not particularly good for lending. And they also may be considered as a tax, which is, again, not very good for lending, although banks may try to substitute away from reserves into other forms of uh, investments. And that, in aggregate, could be positive. Okay, thank you, Claudio, and thank you to our three speakers. I think it was a very interesting discussion, and it uh, complements uh, very well the first uh, debate that we had in the, in the, in the morning and also the, this, uh, the speech uh, given by President Dagar. So, uh, Volker, I guess that uh, we have to stop uh, for one hour uh, lunch break, uh, but I pass you the, the, the floor so that you give us uh, the details on where uh, we should uh, resume the, the conference, please. Put me loud? Yeah, Governor Dicos, thank you very much um, for...